Welcome to back to the show, Whitney. Hey, great to be here, Jimmy. Whitney, you ever think of changing your name to Whitey? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, okay, I was just curious. I thought about using my middle name, though, because I live in Latin America, and everyone, I have to explain my name by saying I have the same name as Whitney Houston, and I've gotten very tired of that. Uh-huh. So. See, that's what I'm saying. Go with Whitey. <laughs> she should have went with Whitey Houston. Whitey Houston. <laughs> that's, that's what I would be. <laughs> So you live in Chile. Is is there less surveillance in Chile? Uh, mm, I don't, you know, I don't really have illusions of privacy for like really any country at this point, um, because I think, you know, a lot of the tech that any anyone uses really in, in, in any country is Silicon Valley dominated. And all of those companies have deals with uh, signal intelligence agencies in the U.S. and and elsewhere. Right. So. I don't know. I mean, Chile is not uh, perfect, but I definitely think it's a little, you know, some of the surveillance tech, like, you know, street cameras, facial recognition when you're walking on the street, that kind of stuff isn't really here yet the way it is in like some U.S. cities. Is it is it easier to protect your children from propaganda there? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I think, well, my kids are pretty young, honestly, and okay. I kind of... um try and can um you know curate what they watch and stuff and uh, my my daughter goes to a a school that's pretty like free thinking encourages critical thought and like art and stuff so i mean that's nice that you you know kind of have the freedom to choose different schools like that uh why do you think so many people are able to see through the covid lies are unable to see through the government propaganda on israel yeah that's interesting isn't it well you know one thing um that I think is is kind of interesting and that I've thought about and talked to some friends about um, is that I think there were there was an effort during COVID to sort of prop up a certain class of people who were telling the truth about COVID, but then to have them at the same time sort of uh, rebuild trust among specifically like Trump's base and people like that uh, for like neocon foreign policy. So you had groups like Steve Bannon's War Room, for example, uh, basically saying that everything that happened with COVID was the CCP, even though the Trump administration (laughs) was doing like the exact same policies and later, you know, the Biden administration and sort of uh, trying to link it with these with these different policies and uh, neocons. A lot of these uh, neocons from back in the Bush administration uh, or around that era, people like Frank Gaffney set up websites like stopvaxpassports.com and were trying to sort of like rebuild trust by being critical of uh, of the COVID narrative. And then they they get, they regain that trust that they lost, you know, in past eras like the Iraq war era. And then they're sort of able to uh, be like, hey, look what's happening now and, and manufacture, you know, consent with that particular group for what Israel's doing right now. But I think it's not really working so much because so much – Um, of Israeli uh, propaganda is about dehumanizing Palestinians. And during the COVID era, people that um, didn't get vaccinated, that didn't, uh, you know, submit to lockdowns and stuff like that were also dehumanized. So a lot of these people are like, wait, um, well, I think there's more people anyway that, you know, maybe sort of see through that tactic because it just happened to a totally different class of people all over the world. Right. Yeah, I I couldn't. uh, That's good observation. Yeah. Um, well, let's get into, there's been some recent revelations. Now, this is from uh, Michael Schellenberger, and he wrote this article. I'm going to show yours also. CTIL files, number one, U.S. and the U.K. military contractors created sweeping plan for global censorship in 2018. New documents from new whistleblower shows. And the subheadline here. His whistleblower makes trove of new documents available to public and racket showing the birth of censorship industrial complex. It came in reaction to Brexit and Trump election in 2016. Now, I. That's when the establishment lost control of the narrative and democracy actually happened. And when people voted, they voted for Trump and then they voted for Brexit, which are two things the establishment did not want. And so mm-hmm. they had to quickly snap into uh, in, into into their plan of grabbing back the narrative, right? And so, and a big part of that was this new censorship industrial complex. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's fair. And then also, you know, in the same period of time, another thing that was happening around that same year or so is that Microsoft launched their what they called the Defending Democracy Program. And one of the parts of that uh, main components of that was called NewsGuard. 
which was a major uh, censorship effort as well that I think was launched yeah. in 2018 uh-huh. uh, also. And basically uh, was a built in like uh, sort of like a pop up, I guess you'd go to a, a news website and NewsGuard would tell you if it was trustworthy or not. And they were very suspect and funded by a bunch of, uh, you know, private advertising companies and, uh, you know, big corporations and stuff and have uh, sort of been outed for being, um, you know, just like the CTI leak here, uh, censoring people just for having different political opinions, uh, not really going after fake news, more about narrative control, which is pretty consistent with, so, you know, most of this, uh, you know, industrial censorship that's been going on. So I just heard... Um... Tim Poole mentioned that he uses NewsGuard. I was I was gonna hold back from saying really? it I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He and I'm brought like, it up. That's the first I heard of it was him saying NewsGuard was good. I, I never heard NewsGuard was good before, but I think he's I think he uses that to show, hey, look, even their approved press is telling I me this. I think I've stuff. seen him since say it's not that good, but this is the one that you're yeah. supposed to use. Yeah. So but so let me just this Who is, says you're supposed to use it. Microsoft? Sure. Yeah. So it was kind of like Peter Dow tried his own version of that too with Verit, Verit or something. And, um, but he didn't have Microsoft behind him, so it failed. But um, here from this article, the whistleblower alleges that a leader of CTI League, what does CTI stand for? Cyber? Cyber Threat Intelligence. <laughs> the whistleblower alleges that a leader of Cyber Threat Intelligence. <laughs> it's so funny. This they, is like, they, when they formed, they called themselves like the Cyber Justice League. I mean, it's, it's just it's 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 like right out of a absurd. Saturday morning cartoon when I was a kid. I like how this these it's, elections were our Hamas election. Yeah, that's like, right. You can never have power. You're never allowed to be part of democracy again. You voted Hamas, that's Trump, <laughs> Brexit. They're that, all the same thing. Trump and Brexit. Yeah. Is that like they're they're mm-hmm. Hamas? So the whistleblower alleges that a leader of the CTI League, a former British intelligence analyst, was in the room at the Obama White House in 2017 when she received the instructions to create a counter disinformation project to stop, quote, a repeat of 2016. So there is Barack Obama's White House joining up with uh, British intelligence and, of course, our own deep state. And I'm, I wouldn't, I'm sure Mossad, because the deep state in America is Mossad. And what, and what is this all about? This isn't about getting rid of uh, disinformation or conspiracy theories. This is about making sure that someone who comes from outside the two political mainstream party systems never gets to do that again, and that people never get to express their will in their vote ever again, right? Isn't that what that says to you? Yeah, that's a big part of it. But actually, if you read Biden, uh, Biden administration, like documents on on this kind of stuff, they say things like uh, they essentially say, like, people can't disagree anymore about politics, like people disagreeing and debating politics, like is supposed to be normal is a, is a sign of like discord and threatens democracy and all of this stuff. So, so I guess we all have to agree 100 percent of the time about everything. So this idea um, that that the Democrats and Barack Obama are about democracy is exactly backwards. Barack Obama serves the same people that George Bush and Dick Cheney did, serves the same people that mm-hmm. Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton did, the same people that Ronald Reagan did and George Bush the first, and now Joe Biden and Antony Blinken do. They serve the same exact billionaire class, military industrial complex, WEF, those Bilderberg, those same same handful of billionaires that run everything they serve them Barack Obama was a fake he was a complete fake and it's funny to still see people who see through a lot of conspiracies and see through a lot of the propaganda say things like Barack Obama was the best president of my lifetime yeah he was the best actor president of my lifetime yeah. he made you feel like he was he a, real a real west wing feel yeah he can pull <laughs> off a real west wing feel as kurt just said but he was serving the exact same in nefarious interests his entire cabinet came from one email from Citigroup, and from that's Group. and the reason i know yeah. that is because julian assange revealed that through wikileaks which is why the establishment including barack obama have been trying to kill him ever since okay yeah so moving on a little bit more in this article, the whistle. OK, so the ambitions of the 2020 pioneers of the censorship industrial complex went far beyond simply urging Twitter to slap a warning label on tweets or to put individuals on backlists. The amit, the ad- adversarial misinformation and influence tactics and techniques called amit. So that's adversarial misinformation and influence tactics and techniques. 
the their framework calls for discrediting individuals as a necessary prerequisite of demanding censorship against them. And so I've experienced this. So I knew that when the Bill Gates funded fact checkers on Facebook would do a bogus fact check of some of my whatever it was, whether it was COVID or the vax or lockdowns or about Syria or whatever it was, uh, that was a prerequisite to get me completely banned and then also to get our financial services cut off. So that's the game that I could yeah. see that they were doing that. I'm like, why would they care about this? And why would they have this uh, this no name journalist try to fact check me? Oh, I get why they're doing this. They're setting the predicate so they can censorship, censor me completely if they needed yeah. to and cut off my finances. Right. You're hip to that. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, the financial services has been uh, their big angle so far, but they definitely have plans to escalate. So uh, the DOJ, the FBI, and the Secret Service of the U.S. right now are part of this public-private partnership um, that's under the, you know, operates under the World Economic Forum, but it's run by a career Israeli spy, and they want to uh, label anyone that uh, publishes misinformation online as a, you know, cyber terrorist, essentially a cyber criminal. And so, is the term. and so, because Barack so. Obama repealed the. Uh, uh, habeas corpus. He basically did that in the uh, National Defense Authorization Act, Section 1021. What that means is, if they can, if they say you're a terrorist, meaning an act, if you if you protest against a pipeline, that's they call you an environmental terrorist. Eco terrorism. You're an eco terrorist. If if you pr protest, if you uh, if you put something they consider misinformation on the internet, you're called a cyber terrorist. So if they consider you a terrorist. They can throw you in jail, what's called indefinite detention, meaning they don't ever have to give mm -hmm. you a trial because they've already determined that you're a terrorist. So they don't. So we don't. This idea that, again, voting for Joe Biden or Democrats is saving democracy is the exact opposite. It's ensuring that we'll never have democracy again and we'll always live under authoritarian rule. I just want people to know that. I think people who watch this show know that, but maybe somebody is watching this for the first time. That's not what democracy is, Jimmy. Democracy is when you have like really diverse MCU characters. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so... The sum total of the documents is clear. So you just mentioned this, that it's a coordinated, sophisticated effort by the United States and UK governments to build a domestic censorship effort and influence operations similar to the ones they have used in foreign countries. In June 2018, this woman named Jane Turp, by the way, she spells her name J-Y-N-E, never trust a Jane that puts a Y in her name. In June 2018, Jane Turp attended a 10-day military exercise organized by the United States Special Operation Command, where she says she first met this guy Brewer and discussed modern disinformation campaigns on social media. Wired, the magazine Wired, summed up the conclusions they drew from their meeting that misinformation they realized could be treated the same way as a cybersecurity problem. So somebody hacking into your database or somebody trying to shut down you uh, hacked my narrative is what they're saying so they're saying if you have a counter narrative that can be treated the same way they treat an actual hacking of cyber so reality is more classified than <laughs> that's great yes uh he was brewer went on to describe how they first thought they were getting around the first amendment his work with jane turp he explained was a way to get non-traditional partners into one room, including maybe somebody from one of the social media companies, maybe a few special force operators, operators, and some folks from the Department of Homeland Security to talk in a non-attribution, open environment in an unclassified way so that we can collaborate better, more freely, and really start to change the way that we address some of these issues. So... This was their attempt to get around the First Amendment. This is their attempt to bring people in from social media in with intelligence operators and to censor people. When asked whether Terp or the CTIL leaders discussed the potential violation of the First Amendment, the whistleblower said they did not. The ethos was that if we get away with it, it's legal, just like the mafia. And there was no First Amendment concerns because we have a public-private partnership. That's the word they use to disguise those concerns. Private people can do things that public servants can't do, and public servants can provide 
leadership and coordination. And now so fascism. So that's so when the government wanted to censor, they would set up a private censorship organization like they did at Stanford University. And they would say, oh, no, that Stanford University do it. They're private. They're di but it was in coordination with the government and the deep state of the United States and the UK. And so here's your article, which is at Unlimited ha Hangout. Now, you wrote about this. So Michael Schellenberg is getting to it now in 2023. But you pretty much wrote about this in 2020. You were way ahead of the curve. You, here's your meet, meet the IDF linked cybersecurity group protecting U.S. hospitals pro bono. And <laughs> that's, <laughs> well, that's nice free. of them. Yeah. Wow. You, mm -hmm. They say they're ruthless, but I mean, so, then they go and do this. Anonymous volunteer. They called themselves, vo they're volunteering to help. Is this, do we have the dumbest country on the face of the earth? Well, yes, we have the most propagandized, that's for sure. Anonymous volunteers from an opaque group founded by the former commander of Israel's Unit 8200 have been granted access to some of the most critical private and public networks in the United States healthcare and pharmaceutical sectors. That's great. With the help of the U.S. federal agency, now run by a former Microsoft executive. You wrote this in August of 2020. Yep. So, uh, and here's another article. Oh, no, this is the same one. So same article. Hardly any media attention has been given to the dramatic and unsettling changes that have been made to a hospital and healthcare information technology systems and infrastructure under the guise of helping the United States healthcare system cope with the surge in data as well as an unsettling uptick in cyber attacks. Now, yeah, were, so were, there real, were there really an uptick in cyber attacks or did they just say there were so they can do this? This was, a, so they, this was allegedly happening, and I wrote this during the first year of COVID, right? But this, this alleged uptick in these issues where the healthcare system IT-wise couldn't cope was because at the exact same time COVID was happening, the department, uh, well, HHS, uh, cut their budgets for IT ah. for hospitals around the country. So basically like putting them in a position where they would be overwhelmed. And then this group uh, run by, you know, uh, you know, a guy that's basically still an Israeli intelligence operative and, and people at Microsoft with his, with ties to the national security state in the U S come riding to the rescue to offer their services for free uh, to hospitals and the pharmaceutical sector. And then they expand to chemical plants, dams, and nuclear reactors. And so then they later get involved in censorship, which is what Schellenberger covers, but they're, uh, uh, CTI League has been doing a lot more than just uh, misinform alleged misinformation uh, stuff. So this is real. Sure. This is real. Brave New World, um, 1984 stuff. That um, it's all about controlling the info. It's all about controlling information. It's all about propagandizing, and it's all mm -hmm. about censoring anybody who has a counter narrative to what the establishment mm -hmm. wants. That's a cyber attack. If you're saying the wrong thing. If you're thing, saying the wrong thing, they're going to treat it yeah, as a cyber yeah. attack, literally. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the surge of cyber attacks combined with major budget cuts has made hospitals even more vulnerable as many are compelled to do more with less. As a result, there have been a renewed push for the improvement of cybersecurity at hospitals, clinics, and other healthcare institutions throughout the country. Amid this backdrop, an odd group of cyber threat intelligence analysts with ties to the U.S. government, Israeli intelligence, and tech giant Microsoft have volunteered to protect U.S. healthcare institutions for free and have even directly partnered with U.S. federal agencies to do so. They've also recently expanded to offer their services to governments and social media platforms to target, analyze, and neutralize alleged disinformation campaigns related to the coronavirus crisis. Well, son of a bitch, they're just good-hearted volunteers, Whitney. What problem do you have with these people? Yeah, well, the fact is... Um there's a lot of problems. Uh, one, the guy that created the CTI League is a guy named Ohad Zaydenberg, whose entire career at Israeli intelligence was uh, attacking Iran. And then he leaves uh, formally Unit 8200 and works for this state, Israeli state affiliated cybersecurity company, where he focuses on Iran. He says it's a strategic, a strategic intelligence target. And so he's still basically 
doing what he did in unit 8200 for this private company, which he is was at at the time he created uh, CTI League. And he has been since CTI League was founded and before uh, blaming Iran for a series of cyber attacks conducted against the U.S. critical infrastructure um, and other systems, and also accusing them of misinformation campaigns with little to no evidence. But you get this headline that'll say stuff like, Iran hacked this, Iran hacked that. But if you actually read uh, what you know, Zadenberg's claim as to why it's Iran, he'll be like, medium to high probability it was Iran because uh, this person's believed work history, so like not even confirmed work history, uh, is similar to a previous uh, operation conducted by an Iranian group that they don't specify. The they don't playbook. say what the overlap is. I mean, it's just whatever. So, so anyway, yeah. uh, this guy has been attributing attacks to a foreign power for a long time, and specifically Israeli intelligence uh, for years has had uh, basically unlimited funds and, and powers to try and goad the U.S. into uh, striking Iran first, so Israel doesn't have to do it first, either via a preemptive strike or, or some other you know attack on it for the purpose of advancing regime change in Iran, or if you look at what's going on with Israel and Gaza right now and the, and the possibility this could spread to a regional war, um, if it does and they want to get the U.S. involved, you know, it it's not that hard with a group run by Ohad Zadenberg being in all of our critical infrastructure systems. You know what I mean? Yes. And then being like, oh, the guy I've been blaming, the country I've been blaming for cyber attacks my whole career is responsible. Also, why are we letting a foreign spy um, into our critical infrastructure? Free. It was free. Because it says volunteering and it's for free. Well, you don't like a right, deal? Right. It's for free. So here you say, while these analysts have claimed to have altruistic motives, its members who have identified themselves publicly have notably dedicated, just as you said, much of their private sector careers to blaming nation states, namely Iran, but also China, for hacking and most recently for cyber attacks related to the coronavirus crisis, as well as the 2020 presidential campaign. So <laughs> that explains... Why the child pornography I found planted on my hard drive was in Mandarin with a strong Hebrew accent. Am I right? <laughs> uh, so huh. the idea an Israeli is going to do that kind of work for free just out of the goodness of their heart. I know a lot of Israelis. That's not a thing they do. I think you're trafficking in anti-Semitic tropes no, right Jews now. Jews are very generous. <laughs> very generous. I said Israelis. No, nah, they don't. They look at us the way we look at Canadians. Like we're <laughs> like we're kind of pussies. Yeah. So the final slide from your article I'll read is these individuals and their employers rarely, if ever, make their reasons for assigning blame to state actors available to public scrutiny and also have close ties to the very governments, namely the U.S. and Israel, that have been attempting to gin up hostilities with those countries in recent years, particularly Iran, suggesting a potential conflict of interest. So Potential. <laughs> potential. So how so uh, so we have to go to you to get this information and we have to go to Michael Schellenberg to get the whistleblower talking about the censorship wing of this. Why do you think this isn't being reported to the world's number one news journalist uh, Rachel Maddow? Why isn't she reporting this? <laughs> or or Sean Hannity, um, he's always got his finger on the pulse. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that corporate media, the same people that essentially own corporate media, own our politicians and, own, you know, influence a lot of, you know, what gets censored and what doesn't get censored by the state. You know, um, I, I think essentially, you know, basically the U.S. is a giant public private partnership and uh, they work together to decide how to keep the little people down at the end of the day. Right. So um, corporate media and, you know, in the U.S., it's the, the line between being corporate media and state media, I think, is like, you know, it's essentially the same thing. It's like a CBC. Uh, at this point. Yeah, this is. They toe the line and they'll never not toe the line. If you're talking about like cable TV news, um, you know, like the big channels and stuff, uh, they just don't cover this stuff. And they definitely don't, you know, very rarely criticize Israel. I mean, it's taking, you know, a, an a, a underestimated uh, 20,000 death toll in Gaza to get like criti some light criticism of Israel, of the IDF from CNN and stuff. I mean, 
What about their hurt looks that they make when the Israelis show up on American TV? I don't believe any of the videos of destruction. Watch the actual Israeli people, politicians coming on American TV and openly saying the craziest shit. It's like right after I just got done hearing what a madman Putin is, the same channel I'm watching a guy go, yeah, yeah. war sucks. Yeah. You got to kill... We got to kill do, civilians. We got to right? do it Dresden. We got to hey, Americans did Dresden and they did Nagasaki. So we're going to do this to Gaza. I mean, you got war. This war is hell. That's and then what, they just sit there looking hurt. And then and then Wolf Blitzer goes. He makes a sad face. So he used to work for APAC, didn't he, Blitzer? Yes, of course he. Yes, he did. Yeah. And I'm sure Jake Tapper wanted to. <laughs> um, <laughs> so how how much in control? Is this uh, uh, deep state, uh, this international deep state of the uh, Mossad, UK, and the CIA here in the United States, how much in control are they, you think? Um, uh, you mean of what? Of like the U.S., of global happenings? Um, yeah, of, of, of yes. Influencer stuff? Yeah, so Can I think it's movies? actually a lot bigger, uh, frankly, than just, you know, the U.S., U, uh, U.K. and Israel, though I definitely think that's just like a very core group. So let's take, for example, the stepfather of Anthony Blinken, the man that raised him, Samuel Pisar, right, who was also uh, Robert Maxwell's lawyer and best friend. Um, Samuel Pisar testified to the Congress in the early 70s and said that what was happening at that time was what he called the rise of the trans ideological corporation, where uh, the the big corporations in, or the big CEOs and oligarchs basically of the West uh, were going to uh, the people that owned state-owned companies in the East, like communist Russia and China, and making deals with them to create the trans ideological corporation where there would be basically a group of businessmen that would run the world and would make national sovereignty completely irrelevant. And a lot of this group uh, is essentially uh, trying to do that. And I think that kind of explains why you have uh, every country in the world, including, you know, in the in the Russia, China sphere, and then also in the West, uh, following the same playbook with stuff like COVID-19. And uh, pushing for all this stuff like digital IDs and central bank digital currencies and all of that stuff at the same time. Um, so, I mean, there may be like, you know, these hostilities between, you know, the West and the East in terms of, you know, geopolitical tensions, but there's a lot they agree about at the end of the day. And that is because you have this group, this really, I hate to use this word because QAnon ruined it, but basically a, a cabal of businessmen, you know, basically um, directing a lot of policy because they have the money and they have the power and they've been accumulating that for a very long time. Right. So this different? is the guy that raised Anthony Blinken, by the way, Wow. that was telling that to Congress. And he, a congressman asked him, asked Samuel Pisar if he thought this trans ideological corporation was good or bad. He was like, mostly good. Um, like but basically, I mean, company. it was basically a, a plan to, Something like that. Yeah. And it, it was definitely tied up with like organized crime in the U.S. You had like Chicago mobsters and stuff sort of involved with this effort, too. You had Israeli intelligence uh, assets like uh, Robert Maxwell and he had all these, um, you know, different actors involved. And they've been doing a lot of stuff, uh, you know, for a very long time and are a big part of the deep state in the U.S. and Israel, which honestly, I've argued for years, uh, the U.S. national security state. Try not to use deep state that much because it's really, you know military and intelligence, right, generally speaking, like the most unaccountable parts of government. So the U.S. and Israeli deep states, national security states have essentially fused, I think. I think it's really a binational national security state. You can't really separate one from the other anymore. Um, but you can see this this stuff about the trans ideological <sighs> corporation even in that too. So um, it, like one of the ways Samuel Pisar, when he was testifying to Congress, said this was going to happen or it was happening was through technology transfer. Um, so Israel, because of its special relationship with the U.S., gets all this U.S. military tech, but they've passed a ton of that uh, to China, right, to sort of like equalize the playing field. But it's part of this sort of plan for for transnational global governance at, at the end of the day. So a lot really? of these guys, in order to push through the agendas they all agree about, like digital ID, CBDCs, uh, need there to be various types of catastrophes to sort of implement the 
uh, the types of uh, infrastructure they need for this sort of global governance by the trans ideological corporation to come through. And so digital ID is like a huge part of that. And so is this programmable, surveillable money uh, that we're seeing being implemented everywhere. So, wait, wait, did you say they leaked it to China like on purpose for China to like reverse engineer it or something? What, what yeah, you say? They, they literally passed it to them. So we since like like a Roswell event, but but to help China <laughs> have yeah, yeah, yeah. It, surveillance. It, it, it started at the end of the 70s and went through the 80s and 90s, even before Israel had official diplomatic relationships, uh, a relationship with with China. Um, it's actually the reason Epstein was visiting the Clinton White House in the mid 1990s so often was because that was what was going on there also. Have, have you read that? This, you know, guy, Richard Grove, he sent me that. Uh, yeah, tragedy. I'm familiar. Mm -hmm. He He's sent me nice that guy. tragedy and hope book by Carol Quigley about mm -hmm. the development and the guy writing. It's the same kind of thing. He's writing the history of this like shadow gun. Sounds exactly like what you're talking about that Cecil Rhodes started. Yeah, and, yeah. And um, he's for it. He's like, why is this a secret? It's going to be great. A new world order. <laughs> and then they, he great. found out they didn't want him talking about it. Come see us do a live stand up show. We'll be in Venice, California, Palmdale, California, Omaha, Des Moines, Milwaukee, Lansing, Bend, Oregon, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, Boston, Massachusetts, and we're going to Europe. Do you live in Europe? We're going to be there. Go to jibido.com for a link for all those tickets. Yeah.